So the SPP, the Security and Prosperity Partnership, so-called, aka NAFTA Plus, aka Deep Integration, aka NAFTA on steroids, is, according to its proponents, the logical extension of what started with the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement and continued with NAFTA. The SPP is the next stage in integration. So I think it's worthwhile to look at what the last 20 years has brought us since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was implemented to, to see the logic of this next stage in the integration agenda. When I was wet behind the ears as a new member of parliament for Burnaby New Westminster, I was assigned to the Standing Committee on International Trade. And we would have corporate CEOs come forward and inevitably, their presentations on trade policy uh, always contained a, a phrase basically went as follows, that NAFTA has brought, quote, unprecedented prosperity to Canadians, close quote. Almost all the corporate CEOs had the same phrase in their presentation. So I asked them, what do you mean, unprecedented prosperity for Canada? And they would say, well, annual income, average income in Canada has risen since the uh, Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was implemented. And I said, well, <laughs> average income is a notoriously unreliable indication of what's actually happened. Is it the same for all income levels? Corporate CEOs would shuffle their paper and they would say, well, we don't know. Ask Statistics Canada. So I went to Statistics Canada and I asked them for the income figures by income levels, in other words, from the poorest to the richest Canadians since 1989. And they said, we gather these statistics but we don't compile them, and we don't publish them. Hence started a one-year battle to get the information from StatsCan. Uh, we finally succeeded, the NDP finally succeeded in releasing those figures last year. We released an update in the fall of 2007. And here's what has happened to Canadian families since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was implemented in 1989. Come no surprise to any of you that for the wealthiest of Canadians, the wealthiest 20%, their average income has gone up nearly 20%. And that uh, one-fifth of Canadians now takes half of all income in Canada and holds 75% of all wealth. But it hasn't been the same picture for other income categories. For the upper middle class, that next one-fifth or the next 20% of Canadians, uh, their income has stagnated, hasn't gone up and hasn't gone down since 1989. But the figure becomes more and more interesting as we go down the income ladder. For middle income Canadians, for middle class Canadians, they've actually lost on average one week of income for each and every year since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was implemented. In other words, they're working 52 week years, they're only being paid the equivalent of 51 weeks. For lower middle class, the next one-fifth of the Canadian population, the income fall has been even greater. They've lost on average two weeks of income for each and every year since 1989. In other words, free trade for them has not been free. It's come at the cost of two weeks of income per year for each and every year since 1989. They're working 52 week years, they're getting paid the equivalent of 50 weeks. And the income fall has been most catastrophic for the poorest of Canadians. The poorest one-fifth of Canadians have lost on average a month and a half of income for each and every year since the Canada-US Free Trade Agreement was implemented in 1989. They're working 12 month years, working harder than ever. They're getting paid the equivalent 10 and a half months. So it's no secret why tonight estimates range as high as 300,000 Canadians will be sleeping outside the main streets and the parks of our cities. We have seen a catastrophic fall in income the poorest of Canadians since 1989. So far from being free, free trade has cost the poorest of Canadians, on average, a month and a half of sorely needed income. Now, StatsCan also tells us that over this same period, that Canadians are working harder than ever. Average Canadian families working about 200 hours more now than they were back in 1989. So they're working longer and longer hours for less and less pay. And StatsCan also tells us that over this same time period, the average debt load of the Canadian family has doubled over this period. 
And here's a final step that I think is very relevant, particularly for the youngest of Canadians. Most jobs created in today's economy are part-time or temporary in nature. And the starting wage, particularly for younger Canadians, is much lower than it was 20 years ago. So let's look at this scenario. Let's look at what we have done for the youngest of Canadians. We have record levels of student debt. The average student debt load now is 26,000 when people graduate from trade school, from post-secondary education. Those younger Canadians come out into a job market where their starting salaries are much lower than before and where their chances of getting full-time family-sustaining work are much lower than they were 20 years ago. They go onto a job market with part-time or temporary jobs, combining two or three part-time jobs, a temporary job that they then move, hopefully, to another temporary job. And their chances of moving through that into a family-sustaining income are much lower than they were back in 1989. And here's a final statistic that is very telling. Most of the jobs created in today's economy don't come with benefits and don't come with pensions. So that same young person today who's managed to pay off their student debt is looking at a future at 60 or 65 years where most probably they won't have access to a company pension. What are we doing to the youngest members of our society? We are mortgaging their future by lower starting wages, temporary part-time jobs, and jobs that do not come with a pension. Far from being free, free trade agenda has come at a pretty enormous cost. So this idea that essentially the SPP is a logical conclusion of an integration process that started back in 1989 simply does not hold water. That is the context and the background for the SPP. So let's talk a bit about how the SPP started. Well, it's important to note that this was a liberal agenda put in place by Paul Martin back in 2005. Jack Layton was the first parliamentarian to speak out against the SPP on the eve of that first summit back in 2005. And since then, as many observers have noted, like Jessica Johnson from this magazine, the transition from the liberal SPP agenda to the conservative SPP agenda has been seamless. In other words, what Stephen Harper is doing is simply implementing what the liberals put into place in the first place. 